when I would hire people, any level of the company, I would see what they look what they look like in the interview. Are they sitting back in their chair talking like this? Or are they they're sitting forward, maybe with the arms are on the desk, bright eyed and bushy tailed, ready to go, high energy. Dr. Roberts, we're going to talk about tonight, if it's okay, even though you could, you know, take us wherever you want to go. But in particular, we would love to talk about hiring superstars, building a dream team, building loyalty, corporate culture, and the very delicate conversation of moving people off the bus when necessary, firing. With that intro, a very special warm welcome. Dr. Rich Roberts, thank you so much for joining me here on 77 WABC. Thank you for having me, Yitzhak. Um, for those who are going to watch this on video, I'll just note that you have your cichlid fish tank in your background. <laughs> I have mine in my background. So this is the the war of the cichlid. The, the African battle cichlid of the tanks. cichlids. The battle yes. of the cichlids. That's correct. My <laughs> cichlids are there. His cichlids are there. And because of social distancing, they're not getting near each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd love that. <laughs> I do like that. I like that. That's a good one. That's good. <laughs> uh, let's jump right in. Hiring. Uh, it's such a big area, and you have so much experience in this area. Perhaps we could start with the journey of hiring a superstar, the criteria for a job. How important is that? How, is, how important is it for a company to be clear in the job description? Perhaps you could shed the light and explain and by the way this is going to be a youtube episode this is being video besides of seeing our fishies we're going to have some great content so this will be up on youtube yes dr roberts all yours okay um there's a lot to talk about so and in the hiring process uh first we even get there uh i do i do want to say that we have spoke we spoke a little this week yes and some of the more the, some of the very sophisticated areas of business you want to save to another show yes you know in the future yes and i'll, so I'll, for example, I'll and sorry for interrupting yes we've we've actually had dr roberts on twice before and we plan on having uh the honor of course uh, he, he he graciously agreed to being on we're going to have a series covering many different areas management advertising product selection there are many areas that we're going to be covering over the uh, in the upcoming months we're paying me at least minimum wage right <laughs> <laughs> like, can we discuss okay. that off the air, please? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, the last check bounced. Um, anyway, okay, let's go on. So, so yeah, so the more sophisticated areas of business, you know, we, we're not going to tackle right now. Right. Ones where, where you know, we would we would have to integrate all the different areas, all the different expertises, um, such as, uh, you know, research, formulation, research and development, yeah. medical and clinical research and development, um, operations, Regulatory affairs, legal, marketing analysis, uh, and this finance, uh, finance, and you bring all these mm -hmm. expertises together mm -hmm. when you're doing um, a product selection in the pharmaceutical industry. Whether you're doing um, um, a, a planning, you know, a business planning for mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five years out, and um, those, that, we're not going to discuss those concepts so far. In, I guess in this series, it's the third show. Well, let's talk about when it comes to hiring people. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most critical areas of a business. If you have, if and you know, uh, uh, Dick Vermeil was the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles uh, a lot of years ago. He went on actually won a Super Bowl with the Rams, uh, but he said that in, when he would go to the draft, instead of drafting for the particular position he needed, he would try to draft the best athlete. And there's a lot to say for that. Yeah, you know, it depends what kind of position you're looking for. And there's obviously very different qualifications that mm -hmm. are needed. Mm -hmm. And then you need to try to, to sort through all the applications and figure out if you're actually getting that right person. Mm -hmm. If you make a mistake and you get the wrong person, it could be a whole lot of headaches and potentially legal entanglements and poisoning of the well of the of the, uh, yeah. the student body, so to say. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, hiring is, is really, really critical. When I first joined the company, we had about 100, 110 employees. Um, the company was not very sophisticated at that time, uh, much more distribution, the tiny little bit of generic manufacturing going on. Um, and then as the company grew and eventually, including with our contract sales force, uh, we had about, about 800, 800 employees. As we grew from about $35 million in sales to, to over $600 million a year in sales, 
the, then the, the quality of people, the capabilities that we brought in changed dramatically. And I can tell you a lot about that, but let's start first basic hiring. Yeah. You must know what you're looking for need and you need to write a somewhat detailed job description. Don't bypass this. <laughs> if you're looking for someone who's going to work in your warehouse and who's going to be able to pack boxes, that's one skill set. If you're looking for someone who's going to run finance, uh, it depends even what area of finance, what level of finance. If you're a smaller company, your sales are a half a million, a million, three, four, five million a year, that's going to require more of an accountant. As you start to grow bigger and you're going to get and, and massive amounts of cash are flowing through, then you really need a, an expert in finance. Um, and by the way, if you're doing manufacturing, manufacturing itself is an entirely different um, um, accounting or financial expertise, because there you need to be able to know how to allocate labor costs, raw material costs, machine time, and allocate all these things in terms of absorb, absorb, um, absorbing overhead right. and, and, and dropping the bottom line. So but let's just talk about the basic hiring of people. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you have to put, get out your job description, what you're looking for. Then you're going to get in a resume. You need to start with the resume. First of all, look for how long this person has stayed in jobs. If you find someone has changed jobs every six months to one year to two years, and they've been in five different jobs in the last 10 years or the last seven years or five years, that's a real warning sign. Now they're gonna tell you all the reasons. This management team didn't know what they were doing and I left and then that managed, this company was going into business, so I left. Everybody's got an excuse but it's a real warning sign. Did they not get along with people? Did they talk a good game, this person, in getting hired? But then when it came to performing, they really didn't perform. Um, are there other skeletons? Is there aberrant behavior? Is there theft? Uh, is, is there fraud? So um, I'm not saying it can't be good. And there are some people who leave, switch jobs every couple of years because they are on an upwardly mobile path. And you'll see that they were a supervisor then became a manager, then became a director, became vice president. But even with that, with the switching every two years, now know that if, I mean, my company was based on loyalty. I was truly loyal to our employees. In front of them, behind the scenes, a lot of pressure I felt on myself was because of my love for my employees and my caring about them and their families. Um, and, and my employees were loyal back to me. But if you're someone's jumping jobs all the time, there is no loyalty. And if they're going to leave for another $1 an hour, $5 an hour, or another $150,000 a year, um, depending on what their salary is, the bonus, you need to, so that's one warning sign when you see right. them changing, right. changing jobs a lot. Mm -hmm. um, another thing to do is question them on the details of their resume. <clears throat> now, as especially as you get to higher levels of, of, capability or expertise. Um, if you don't have that expertise yourself, have someone in the room who does. So if you don't know research and development and uh, you know, make sure you have somebody from R&D in there. I'll give you a great example. There was this um, a mistake. I mean, sometimes by mistakes I made, you know, okay. but uh, uh, an executive, I, I, had the, I had the idea. Well, if we're, if we're let's say at that time, $300, $300 million a year company, and this guy was an executive in one of the big pharma companies mm -hmm. that does $100 billion a year. Well, if he can do $100 billion a year work, he can certainly do our $300 million a year work. Years of, uh, one, would year think, of work. one would think, one would think. Yeah, no, uh, no, uh, maybe, but hmm. probably not. Hmm. If they were very high up in that company, they, there's a very good chance they were, they were a politocrat. They were a politically talking type of person. And what, what you do is when, look at what they put on the resume. So if, the, if it's a finance guy and he says under him, they were able to uh, improve their manufacturing processes and save $8 million a year. So they're great, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Which manufacturing processes did you improve? Oh, the making of tablets. Okay. What method were they using to, to granulate the blend, the, the materials for the blend? Uh, bah, 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 I don't know. What was it? Wet granulation? Was it dry blend? Was it extrusion? 
Was it water-based, alcohol-based? Did you use fluidized bed drive? He doesn't know anything. Because then, because if he does anything, when then ask him, well, how did you improve those processes? Right, right. And you find out he doesn't know anything. He happened to be the CFO at the time that the manufacturing and and quality or R and D people made those improvements, and he's taking credit for stuff he doesn't know. Um, remember, we had a, a one guy who came from one of those big big pharma companies. Oh boy, was he good at finding the statistics that showed how great things were. We were losing money hand over fist. We we're heading towards bankruptcy, but he could show you, well, you know, the packaging lines efficiency improved by 15% last year, okay? But he had nothing to do with it. He doesn't know anything about packaging lines or packaging efficiency or switching over the lines to a new product or a new level and the level of, and, and, and the, um, the cleaning and, and the uh, inspections that have to go on and, and the label checks. He doesn't know anything about this. So ask them what's on their resume, but dig into the details of it. And if you don't, if you don't know those areas, make sure you have, if, and if you don't have, an, if you don't have someone in your company who knows it, um, have a, hire a consultant who knows that area to come in and join you for the questioning. So they claim, they claim these things. So go find out if they really know what the things are they're claiming. Another question that has to do with the resume. What's your take on the references that someone lists on a resume? Superb question. Um, generally, the references on a resume are worthless. <laughs> if anybody, if, I'm sorry, if, if someone is applying for a job is even mildly capable they're going to make sure that they spoke to those people first and these are their friends these are their supporters so when you look at the references of the resume it's helpful folks it tells you who not to call <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> i remember one guy I, I was i was looking at hiring potentially and uh you know i don't mean to pick on finance happened to be you know a guy for chief financial officer okay we never hired him and he worked at a certain company and he gave, you know, a couple of the vice presidents on the resume is fine. Mm -hmm. I tracked down the CEO of that company and he said, I'll tell you the truth, but it has to stay here. He can't tell anybody. I said, absolutely. He said, the guy just locked himself in his office from the moment he got in until late at night. He didn't do any leading. Nobody knew what he was doing in there. He was, he was just, basically he was a, number crunching accountant and not a financial leader who is going to get out there when the budgets are out and say after every couple of months, you know, uh, to the different vice presidents, why are you spending this amount over budget? Or it may be research and development. Right. Why are you spending this amount under budget? Right. Is this the project falling? So, um, you, yeah, definitely. When it comes to references, you must check references. You must, must <laughs> check references and understand the references on there, it just go, you have to go to the companies that the person worked at. And you can't call the human resources department right, because obviously. the human resource right. department have no financial incentive to speak right. with you right. about anything except giving some just very general, bland, generic right. response. Feel good, feel good basic then, stuff. Yeah. Yes. Or you can speak to people in the references and ask them the names and telephone numbers of other people who work with this guy. And then you go to them and that's they get referenced. I just want to say one other thing. Sure. A little off this, a little off references, sure. but <clears throat> there are laws against discriminating and hiring right. against veterans. And I got to tell you, to in my experience, it's like one of the craziest laws around, because every veteran that we ever hired were just the absolute most superb employees. Um, and there was a, uh, I remember I saw an interview by a movie director uh, making a, 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 and they hired uh, uh, real Navy SEALs for the movie and he said he couldn't believe it. He would generally, before he, when he has the set going, mm -hmm. he says, this person has to be there, you have to be there, you have to be here. He's used to actors where they're acting up, they're not there on time. And he said, we'll look up and the Navy SEALs, they roll in their spots. They're ready to go <laughs> immediately. That's amazing. Um, in my experience, military training is, I mean, it's, 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 it's great for the society. It's great for, um, teaching people how to perform. Right. It's great for teaching people how to organize in their lives. And in my experience, when it came to veterans, they were the absolutely wonderful employees. Great for the step. company. I mean, great for the company because of their yes. training, their rigid training that they got. And then they apply it in the workplace. It's just a dream for, it's a boon for the business. 
veterans are disciplined, they're hardworking, they understand self-sacrifice, um, they understand deferred gratification, um, and they're very responsible, they communicate upward, and they're really, really great. Dr. Rich Roberts, thank you again for joining me here on Mind Your Business. Thank you. I just want to make a couple more comments sure. about hiring, then we go on to whether you're, whatever your next loyalty, topic is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, loyalty, fine. Um, when I would hire people, <clears throat> this was any level of the company, any level, <clears throat> I would see what, they're look, what they look like in the interview. Are they sitting back in their chair talking like this? Or are they, they're sitting forward, maybe with the arms are on the desk, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to go, high energy. Um, you know, you don't want the guy who's telling you how great he is. You want someone <laughs> who's ready to charge forward. Um, remember, I had a vice president, senior vice president of sales and marketing. You sometimes he'd be talking to him while he's in the chair, he would jump up out of the chair. That's he was like full of energy, ready to go. That's great. So, Proactive. Yes, no matter what, no matter what the job is, you uh, you really do want to get someone who's bright eyed and bushy tailed, and um, that was actually taught to me when I was in medicine by uh, um, wow. a, a physician, Mark Kelly, who was headed at at a Penn, University of Pennsylvania, of the um, House Staff Training Program. Um, so yeah, he was he was great at that. The second thing I want to say is when when I would hire people at higher levels, including at the highest levels. They could be making five hundred thousand dollars a year base salary and bonuses. They might have thirty or forty years of experience. Um, the one question I would ask them is, "What jobs are below you?" And if there's anything that's below them, I didn't hire them. Now, I'm not hiring somebody at that level and paying them that amount of money to to mop the floor. Of course not. But let's say we have a big customer coming in and the floor has to be mopped and nobody's around, if they're not willing to do it, I don't want them. And it's not because I need that floor mopped, but it's because they have an attitude. Right, the principle, an arrogance. the principle, that's right. Yeah, so it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's a, we call it in Hebrew, midos or a mida, right. a right. bad personal characteristic. Right. They might be gaudy, um, um, you know, self-righteous, I go, that's below me. I mean, of course, I'm not going to make my own phone calls. My secretary is going to keep people on the phone for me. No, pick up the phone. If you can't pick up the phone and dial it and make a call, then <laughs> uh, you're not the type that I'm looking for. I, I tell you, by the way, it's very funny, a little little tangent. But yeah. uh, we once had, I think it was a United States senator coming to visit the plant. And I just took a quick walk through. I walked into the granulation department and I saw a little bit of water on the floor in the hallway and there was a mop. So I picked up the mop and I started to go to the puddle of water. Those guys ripped that mop out of my hand so beautiful. fast. Beautiful, it was, beautiful. Yeah, because for them, it you don't like the CEO, President CEO, Dr. Rich Roberts, Dr. Rich mopping the floor. To me, wait, I would go home, I would change dirty diapers. I would throw out the garbage, um, you know, and. It, ridiculous. I'll give you another example. Um, I know this, uh, this happened a number of times when the um, in the um, uh, in the factory part of the, of the company, when the the, every, the workers were in the break room, mm -hmm. and then the, the bell went off, and they'll be coming down the hallway uh, to go back to their you know their manufacturing right. machines. So I saw them coming, so I pulled the door open. And I held it open for them. Nobody wanted to walk through it. <laughs> I said, please, come on. No, no, no. It's okay. You go. Well, I said, no, please just. You're just being a man. It's okay. It's just me. Go through, go through. Um, <laughs> that also sends a signal. That's right. Uh, I hope I'm, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention, uh, you know, Torah and Judaism. On you the can show. mention, just, but, sure, sure. Okay. We have a fundamental concept that every person has a Tselem Elohim. Every yeah. person Every human being yep. has a spark of God in them. Right. There is an intrinsic value, an intrinsic, dig an intrinsic dignity to every person. So everyone deserves to be treated with respect. Um, now, some people I say, oh, well, it's good for business. Okay, maybe it's good for business, but I do it because that's what I believe. Yeah. So treat everybody with respect um, and 
Uh, and, and that's something I look for when I'm going to hire people at, at senior levels to make sure I don't want anybody there who thinks they're greater than everybody else. Now let's move on to loyalty. Now, of course, for uh, those out there with common sense, they understand, just like Dr. Roberts was saying beforehand, if the CEO, it starts at the top. If the CEO is being a mensch, most people will be a mensch because they, it starts at the top. But that said, let's dig in. Building loyalty to the point where people stay, they're enthusiastic, there's low turnover, all those issues, this big topic of loyalty. Dr. Roberts, I hand it right back to you. Okay. There's so much to say. Yeah. I'll tell you a little story. Um, in, in 1997, our company was facing, potentially facing bankruptcy, late 1996. In 1997, and at one point we were we were three weeks from bankruptcy, mm. and we and you know and everyone knew, everyone in the company knew we were in bad shape. They knew that the facility was in a state of disrepair. Um, I had been communicating with people, which is from a human resources perspective, very critical. Tell people the truth. Tell them what's going on, except in certain circumstances yeah. where senior management has to be willing to take the anxiety and take the heat yeah. and protect the people from being too yeah. too worried. Yeah. But, um, you know, but I tell people what's going on, and they all saw it. <clears throat> and they knew that we had people coming and looking potentially to buy the company and investors. Nothing was working out. Things kept getting worse and worse. So when we were just about three weeks from bankruptcy, uh, we had this, this uh, two groups came in, two investor groups, one of them, um, is, uh, I'll tell you, it's Elliott Associates, which I think is the largest hedge fund in the country. And they had a, a the representative on our, you know, the, representing them in this deal uh, to buy into the company, give us money and cash, and who would also be on the board of directors. And um, at one point I told them, I said, look, listen, look, I got to tell you something. This is in a closed meeting. The employees are not around. <clears throat> I said, we, everyone here knows that we're in severe financial straits. Every, all the employees here know that I love them and that I care about them. There's, the unions have come around several times trying to, uni, trying, to uni, trying to unionize the employees and the, the employees totally shut them out. And I've pledged the employees that, that I will not get a raise until they first get a raise. Mm. And I also told them, I don't know if they'll survive or not. But I'm telling you, if we do survive and if we become successful, and if eventually we can sell the company or go on the stock market and, and get money that way, every employee must get stock options now so that they will experience and they will profit from that, from their loyalty to me. And, and if we have success, fine. This group agreed. They, they ended up buying in, fine. Three years later, well, and by the way, the deal was done 24 hours from bankruptcy. Mm. That's when we finally got the deal done. Wow. Three years later, the year 2000, we got back to break even. And the representative for Elliott Associates said, Rich, I want to tell you something. The ultimate reason why we did this deal is when we, when we saw how you stood up for your employees behind closed doors, we knew that we could trust you with our money when we're in Manhattan and in Wall Street and you're here in Philadelphia running the company. Now, I didn't tell them this because I thought it would help them to invest. It didn't even occur to me. And I really had no experience at that point dealing with billionaires or multi-billionaires. No, I have lots of experience with that. But um, I had no experience at Wall Street. I had no experience at that point. But um, this is just a case where uh, it is really to show loyalty. Um, you, you can expect your employees to be loyal to you, but you must be, if, but if you're going to be loyal to them, and by the way, it's not enough just to be loyal to them and to care about them. You have to tell them that you that you care about them. You have to tell them that you're loyal for them. When the health care comes up for renewal each year and the company has to dish out another 600,000, 800,000, 1.2 million a year, or have their co-pays go up, and when I decide the company's going to pay it, I would put out a memo. I would have a bulletin board behind glass 
now it, since everybody has cell phones and right. computer screens, maybe you would That's communicate that way. I'm not sure. Um, but it, you could also do the bulletin board. Maybe it's, maybe it's, no, maybe it's an electronic bulletin board right. in the lunchrooms. But you, you, to all employees from me, telling them this is what the costs went up. We, we, every, almost every company asks you to pay X dollars more each week in copay. But no, we're going to absorb this. And you tell them along the way and you communicate with them. Um, uh, so I can tell you also, I once, go, I once joined a group of presidents of companies, not pharmaceutical companies. As a matter of fact, the rule was uh, any president could only could not have a president in that group from the same industry as any right. other president. Yeah, because it's a conflict and, of interest, whatever. Yeah. Right. And that way you could speak openly and confidentially. Yeah. Yeah. It was shocking how, how often many of our problems and, and challenges were the same problems and challenges. Yeah. Yeah. You just changed the name of the widget or the name of the company. But similar challenges. So um, it's such an important so, point, yeah. And, and I've heard this from many CEOs that any time they're in the room, it's it's kind of the same problems, just a, a different different set of people, different set of circumstances. But you know, life right. is life wherever now, you go. Yeah, now we had our unique situation. I mean, we have we're dealing with FDA. We're a highly reg regulated pharmaceutical right. company. They right. weren't. We also had controlled drugs. We had to deal with DEA. They didn't. We're also, as a pharmaceutical company, you're in the crosshairs of the media, of, of Congress, um, and they, all, every, they just don't want to go out and make a name for themselves. So, you know, um, antitrust division, so it, all these things, um, which actually I, I can talk about that more if you want to take a little break. Uh, but um, I just want to say quickly mm -hmm. that I left the group because these presidents were all out for themselves. Mm. Their main one of the, their main desire was how to get more money for me and how to give less for the employees. And that was so much not the way I viewed my employees. So I viewed, I felt like they, like they were family members. So I, I left the group because of that. So this segment, which focused primarily on loyalty, which of course today the trending term is corporate culture, uh, uh, many key points. One of them, of course, is to communicate. Without communication, you can't expect, out of sight, out of mind, without communicating it to the team, you can't expect them to appreciate everything that the company's doing because it's just like, oh, oh, they really did that? And which, is, which is why also it's very important. If a company is doing something for its team, communicate it, let them know, don't just you know, don't, don't just assume that people will uh, will get it on their own. We We're going to talk about the very sensitive topic: moving people off the bus when necessary. The one word: firing. It's not a pleasant subject, but it's something that uh, all too often companies struggle with, and they hold on to the wrong people for too long. And the, uh, as Dr. Roberts said earlier on the show, it, they poison the well, etc. Dr. Roberts. Perhaps I'm just going to, you know, you could be as open as you could be about the very delicate subject of when a company has to fire someone, an, an employee. Okay. Again, there's many, many issues when it comes to terminating an employee. Now, some, some stuff, some cases are very easy. You know, we had cases, one guy was dealing crack out of the men's room. <laughs> um, so, okay. That wasn't so hard. Um, and there are a couple, there are a few other times when I, great stories I could tell you, but uh, some people were stealing narcotics mm. and we had to run undercover investigations. Wow. One actually in coordination with the Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA. Mm. So those are not complicated. Yeah. Although, I mean, running an under, I would run the undercover operations and you'd have, you know, ex FBI or ex CIA type people who would have, they have companies, they're out there and they're available to hire. And there's all kinds of surveillance and all those things. So those things are those are easy. Right. Now you can have an employee who is just not doing the job that they're supposed to do, um, coming in late, leaving early, uh, not coming back from lunch break one time, performing poorly. If they're supposed to do you know 50 things, they do two. Um, now. You would need to have, if you don't have an experienced human resources manager or director, you need to work with a human resources attorney because you need just to sort of line things up. You first give the person a verbal warning. They, they called in. You always want to have two people on your side to witness it. You call them in the office 
Um, it might be the human, if you have a human resources department, it'll be the human resources director that will do it with someone else there to witness it. And you give them a verbal warning. Look, you, you know, you're supposed to do this and this and this. You're not doing them. Or you keep coming in late. Uh, here's all the days you came in late. You know, we, we can't have it. You, if we let you come in late, we can't let it, everybody else will say there's no consequences to it. So um, you give them first a, a verbal warning, but you must write a memo, uh, a memo to the file detailing who was there, who was there, you and that person with the employee, what you told them the issues were. Then if they don't correct them, you have to give them a written warning. And that written warning needs to say, if you, you know, you need to get these stuff, this stuff fixed. Um, if you don't get it fixed, we're gonna have no choice but to terminate your employment. If they're really just not up to getting the job done for whatever the reason is, um, you could you then go to either a final warning or a performance improvement plan where you say you, we're gonna give you three months or two months or six months, whatever it is, and you need to achieve this and this and this and this objective in that period of time. And if not, then you're gonna be terminated from the company. Now, you would, you would do this always in consultation with an attorney. You will not send any such memo without the attorney reviewing it first. Um, and, and, you, and you might have to accelerate the process depending on how bad the employee is. In, in many cases, some cases, you find an employee is bad mouthing the company. They're, they're stirring up um, uh, discontent among the employees. And now they're kind of really poisoning the environment. And in that case, you may just have to terminate their employment anyway. Now, different states have different laws, but you know, it, our company was in Pennsylvania. That was a, you know, a, um, they were at will employees. So you can terminate them for no reason whatsoever. The trouble is if you do so, uh, many employees will come back and sue you, claiming that you sued them for some kind of discrimination this way or that. Now, if you discriminated them, if you if you discriminated against them in hiring them, I mean, in, in terminating them, well, wait a second, whatever that discriminatory category was, they still had it when you hired them. Right. So you didn't discriminate when you hired them, That's right. but the claiming you discriminated when you fired them. And in most cases, they just want $5,000, $10,000, and they'll go away. Uh, it's just a quick thing. But if they do want to make a big case out of it, you do have to, you know, you might have to fight it, and you do have, um, you know, you have to weigh how much legal expenses are going to cost you, uh, you know, versus, um, you know, let's say it's going to cost you $80,000 in legal expenses, plus you don't know the outcome. You may end up settling with them for 20000 um, but of course, anytime you settle with them, you're going to have a severance agreement, which which requires them not to say anything bad about the company. Um, and right. if anyone calls about how their job was, you, you're going you're gonna to agree what the one line is. You know, we simply don't discuss previous employees, whatever it will be. Mm -hmm. um, don't lie. We never lie. Mm -hmm. So if you do end up paying this person money, then, then it will only be again with a lawyer guiding and a, a human relations, a labor lawyer guiding you. And there will be a, a separation agreement in which there will be things like um, non-disparagement clauses where the employee agrees not to say anything bad about, about the company. The employee agrees not to go to another company and try to hire your key talent away or those types of things. Um, if And by the way, a very good way to pay these things out mm -hmm. is at their normal um, rate of pay. So in other words, if you're going to end up, end up giving them three months of salary, let's say, and they get paid every two weeks, you're going to continue to pay them as this severance every, once every two weeks until the three months are up. That way, if they do start disparaging the company, yeah. doing something to hurt you, that's against this agreement, you just stop the payments. That's a great point. You, you, you hold them, on to the leverage. Once you the whole sum of money, yeah. then the leverage is lost. I, yeah, yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't have the leverage. Um, now, when you deal with much more senior people, many times they will have employment agreements, in which case they'll be it will be already be explicitly in there that if they're severed, they don't, you don't have to give them any reason whatsoever. They're not going to sue the company, uh, and you're going to give them X dollars, and then they're gone. And I have I have used those agreements a, a couple of times. Um, 
the other thing is you can um, you can sort of push someone out, but you can only push them out if it's based truly based on their bad performance. So there's something called constructive termination. If you tell them, okay, your vice president and now your new office is the bathroom and your job is to stand, is to sit in this bathroom stall the entire day. Okay, then they quit, right? Well, you will you will quickly be sued and you will easily lose that as what's called constructive termination. In other words, you created an environment which was equivalent to terminating their employment because they, 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 can't, they can't have that job. Um, but on the other hand, I remember somebody I had at vice president level, and this guy, again, came from a big company. He was power hungry. He kept wanting to take over areas outside of his area of expertise. And, and unfortunately, I was listening to him for a while. And, and then I started to realize what was going on. So when we had a problem in one area, I don't want to say what the area was mm -hmm. for fear that you know, yep. it'll, it'll identify him. Yep. But I, I wrote him, I said, a memo, I said, uh, this is going wrong in that area. Please send me the standard operating procedure that you had established to assure that this wasn't going to happen. Now, he was just a politocrat. He was always just talking, backstabbing, trying to get more stuff underneath him. But he didn't, he didn't know how to actually run anything. There was no plan. And then I started putting the pressure on him that way. Then all of a sudden, one morning, um, my my uh, I see he's calling me. He's calling me, you know, uh, uh, on my phone, calling, calling, calling. I'm not answering. I don't have to be in such a rush to answer the phone. Then my secretary calls me, and she says she's hearing rumors that he's about to quit. He got another job. So, right, like, <laughs> like oh no, he's leaving. <laughs> but I, I held it. I held his feet. To the, right, I held his feet to the fire legitimately right. for his bad performance right. and and now he's getting another job so he, fine he tells me he got another job i wish him make much success i put out a memo to all employees he's found another job in another company we miss him much much success wish him well and then by the way i just have another vice president we're hiring now because i've been interviewing you know not the ducks i've been interviewing <laughs> for the last two months for his replacement <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, but you, you never backstab, never, you know, just, you know, don't do that. You, you don't do that. Let them go. Let them be gone. Um, I'll even give you another mm -hmm. example of this. Now, be careful what I say. There were two employees at very high positions in the company. Very high. Not the top, but very high positions. Making a lot of money. And I had great relationships with employees all through the company. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a lot of employees from India. Um, they, I, for some reason, in India, they, they train, there are a lot of schools in pharmaceuticals. And they teach people in pharmaceutical manufacturing. You'll find many people uh, as immigrants from India who work in, work in pharmaceutical manufacturing. Really good people, hardworking, honest. And um, I, some of them told me that one, is, one of them is in management. He said, these two guys spoke to him about coming with them to another company. And then I did more research and I found out it was true. So I suspended these two guys pending an investigation. We got in lawyers, questioned everybody, including questioning them. And I found out it was true. I actually found out it was true when, the, 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 forget those details. So anyway, um, and, and what happened was that some of the vice presidents said to me, if you terminate them now, don't give them any severance. Give them nothing. They've been totally disloyal. They've been treacherous. I love these guys. I even took them to like some some football games I paid for. You know, I'm a I'm a NFL fan, um, and I, I still like these guys. But they were just. I think they were is just unsophisticated in this regard. There is sort of the fantasy of, of 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 the great advancement got sort of got away from them. So. I could have terminated them. They each were married. They each have young kids, left them with nothing. And then I thought, you know, is this what you want? You want guys, do you want guys in, in the pharmaceutical industry running around, bad mouthing you, going to FDA, making stuff up, causing FDA come in, that just an inspection. They inspected a lot of time anyway, but 
it's money, it's time, it's right. money, right. it's aggravation. Um, so I gave them each one year of salary as a severance, wow. but paid out, right. but paid out right, right, right. every two right. weeks. And they had to sign a severance agreement. Um, and they left quietly, they left happy, they felt terrible. Uh, they felt terrible, they did feel terrible because they had really betrayed me. And I gotta tell you, internally, I was crushed. I trusted these guys, I loved these guys. I was internally crushed. But, you know, yeah, yeah, I, at some point, at all points, you're, you have a responsibility to the company. You need to do what's best for the company. And even if even if you're angry and you say, I'm not gonna give these guys anything, they were treacherous, you still have to think, well, do I want these people aren't running around unhappy? Even though it's not what I wanna do, you have to take care of them. Hmm. The role of the CEO, lonely spot, lonely spot on top. Dr. Roberts, we have roughly one minute left. And I, I, it's, that's an unfair question I'm going to ask, but perhaps just a final 60 second takeaway. Be very careful and do the work as you hire and you have to manage people. Remember, if you're the president of a company, a CEO of a company, people are gonna look at you for the example. I was determined that I would be the hardest working person in the entire company. Nobody would outwork me. And you set that example, you set the example for honesty, you set the example for loyalty, and your employees will emulate it. And if you set the example in the, in the opposite direction, expect your employees to emulate that also. You don't do it because it's good for the company, you do it because it's the right thing to do. I love the honor of interviewing C-level executives and sharing their great advice and perspective on Mind Your Business. I'd love to get your feedback. Post it in the comments below and subscribe. You'll never miss an edition of Mind Your Business.